Hi there and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran rehashing a love song that you wrote in the 1980s into a dog food jingle, or else a scrappy upstart, writing a love song right now that you will one day turn into a dog food jingle in the year 2042, this is your show. Because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. What's up, you guys? It is the last Friday of March, 2019. I'm glad that you're here, and I'm also very happy to tell you that our plucky little podcast here, after three years, has picked up its first uh, official sponsor. So this month's episode is brought to you by a site called Bandzoogle. Uh, Built by musicians and for musicians, Bandzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Now, I'm old enough to remember when you had to pay someone called a web developer to get a website made, and it would always be some guy that you found on Craigslist who drove like a tricked-out Honda Civic, <laughs> and uh, it would cost like 1500 bucks, and then it would be obsolete in six months. Uh, but it's the future now, you guys, and we don't have to do things like that anymore. We can have nice things now, and... Uh, Banzoogle is one of those things. Banzoogle powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. And it has all the features that you need for a professional website. Hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of customizable templates, tools to sell your music and your merch commission-free, uh, mailing list tools, social media integrations, and best of all, live support from a musician-friendly team seven days a week. That's good uh, because I'm functionally illiterate uh, when it comes to computers and coding. So listeners to this podcast can go to bandzoogle.com, B-A-N-D-Z-O-O-G-L-E, and try it for free for 30 days. And if you use the promo code TWS, the initials for this show, TWS, you will get 15% off the first year of any subscription. So thank you, Banzoogle, for believing in this podcast and coming on as our first sponsor. We appreciate it. Uh, if you'd like to hear some of my music live in the coming months, here's where I'm going to be tonight, March 29th in Houston, March 31st in Dallas, May 2nd in Washington, D.C., June 1st in Columbia, Maryland. Uh, and finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, there's a few things that you could do. You could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon, which is a platform that allows you to directly support a creative endeavor that you love. You just head to their site, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You search for The Working Songwriter or you search for my name, and then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month, uh, the price of a cup of coffee or something, to help out the show. It's basically a voluntary subscription. And uh, over there, you also get a bunch of bonus content that I've posted, uh, uh, you know, interviews with past guests, a cool segment that I do with Tim from Strand of Oaks called The Oaks Chamber, uh, a couple Q&As and stuff like that. So head on over to Patreon and become a supporter. That would help. Uh, if you're not in a place to contribute financially, that's cool. I totally get it. Uh, just ask that you would uh, leave us a review in iTunes, which is free, or even freer than that is uh, just tell a friend who you think would dig the show. Uh, word of mouth has really helped us here. So um, that's very free, those two things. And they both help me a lot more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. So thanks for doing those things. Thanks for being here this month. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did having it. Our guest this month is the lead guitarist for My Morning Jacket and a songwriter in his own right, with three solo records to his name. Carl Brommel grew up in Indianapolis, 
After attending music school at Indiana University in Bloomington, he was a founding member of the band Old Pike, which would sign a deal with Epic Records. When that band foundered, he moved to Los Angeles and signed on with My Morning Jacket, just as they were beginning their ascent into prominence. Carl recorded with the band on their 2005 breakthrough album, Z, which introduced the band to a much wider audience. They would go on to make appearances on Saturday Night Live, Austin City Limits, and VH1 Storytellers. They would also receive several Grammy nods for Best Alternative Album over the ensuing years. Somewhere along the way, My Morning Jacket became an American musical institution, selling out shows at the likes of Madison Square Garden and Red Rocks. In 2007, Rolling Stone magazine listed Carl as one of the, quote, 20 new guitar gods alongside John Mayer and Derek Trucks. He's also sat in as a guest guitarist with The Roots on Late Night with Jimmy Fallon. Relix Magazine has said that his latest album, Wished Out, picks up beautifully where his last one left off, quote, like a man sauntering back out to the patio and whittling at the same perfect piece of wood. And Consequence of Sound called that latest effort, quote, some of the most energetic, honest work of Brommel's quietly excellent career. We taped this episode at the end of last year in the midst of the Strand of Oaks Winter Classic in Philly, and I'm very grateful that Carl took the time to sit down and tell us about his life in music. Now, your old man was a musician, right? Your father? Yeah. Were, play, played in symphonies or was a conductor? Yeah, he was a bassoonist. He was a bassoonist. Yeah. And that was his he's, full-time... He's retired now, yeah. Yeah. He played in the Indianapolis Symphony for like almost 30 years. Lifer. Lifer, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So when I was growing up, I'd be sitting in his music studio uh, watching him make reeds. So when you're like a double reed player, you, you're you like saddled with this. I think it's easier now. I think there's like reputable places that make double reeds, mm -hmm. but it was a whole process. He had to like sit and labor over getting big bags of cane and crazy machinery to like file it down, make it perfect. And... uh so not only was he having to practice a bunch, he would like have to do this labor job along with being a musician. Why weren't they commercially made? That seems bizarre. I think they were, but they were just horrible. Like to, to play at the level that he needed to play at, like he needed, he was obsessed. He's kind of like me. Like I'm always like, where's the set list? You know, new strings, you know, sort of like the same sort of mentality. Um, I'm sure there was an easier way, but you know. So it wasn't necessarily common for bassoonists to make their own reads. Your dad was just going to a next level. I think it. I think it was common. I think it still is. Yeah, I think it's part of the whole thing. You know, just that the ultimate <laughs> obsession. And he he would be depressed if he didn't have a good read. He'd be like, "Oh my God, I have a solo, and I just don't have a good read today." And he'd be working on it, trying to get a good one. Yeah. Where would you even, living in Indianapolis in like the 70s or the 60s or the 70s for him, where would you even purchase cane? It would That's get imported. He'd have these huge bags, <laughs> like canvas bags, and there'd just be shavings of like cane everywhere. And then, then I'd sit and listen to him practice, play scales, or he'd play, um, he'd a lot of times he'd play like the grandfather theme from Peter and the Wolf, you know, stuff like that he knew I would How's like. How's that one go? Yes. You know, really scary, but cool. Um, the Prokofiev thing. Well, those um, those professional musicians in symphonies, I mean, they practice for hours a day. Yeah. yeah. Like every day, right? Yeah, and he, his career was really interesting because he... Um, my grandfather in Chicago was a music librarian in the Chicago theater. And um, when it was pre-sound in movies. And he was in charge of getting the music together for the, the orchestra. And so once there became sound in movies, so many people lost their jobs in Chicago. And um, so he was sort of, uh, uh, he, he, he really cultivated music in his family and the kids, but he didn't want them to pursue it as a career. So he was worried about my dad. He's like, you're going to be a, a mechanical engineer because and, he felt burned because he had started a career and then yeah, just and he left. ended up at the radio station flipping records, um, being an engineer. My my grandfather that was like after the uh, his the theater job was done, and uh, so my dad studied uh, engineering for a couple of years and just got really depressed, and then decided he threw it all away and, and studied clarinet. 
and he went back and went through Northwestern on clarinet. And then when he quit or when he got finished with college, he could not find a clarinet job. So he learned how to play the bassoon. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you're a couple of generations deep here in like a, just an obsession, a monomania with music. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. And his parents were deep into it as, um, my grandmother was a, could have been a concert pianist. She went and studied in France and like, it's this beautiful picture. She won a, uh, uh, a piano con contest and won a, a wonderful piano that's still in the family. And you said this, your grandmother, was yeah, this the grandfather who was the librarian? Okay. Yeah. My dad's oh. mom and dad. Yeah. Mainly who we're talking about. So yeah, it is pretty deep. It's pretty deep. And it, it's been fun to watch my dad kind of wrap his head around what I do because uh, he, you know, he, he followed popular music up until about Elvis and he was done. Oh. Absolutely done. He loved, he loves like Dave Brubeck and Nat King Cole and stuff like that. But like he, he, the rock and roll, he just could not get behind. So he had to let go. It was cool. Cause he let, he was good with me. I'm like, dad, I love, I, I'm like, I like the violin. It's fine, but I really, really want a guitar. So it's not just <laughs> that he missed rock. He like actively disliked it. He's like, I don't get it. Yeah. I'm not into it. It was, I think it was just hard, you know, cause his rock stars were, you know, you know, Mahler. Yeah. And Shostakovich and, you know. And when he was slumming it, he was listening to Take Five. Or yeah, and he loved, <laughs> he loved that stuff. He, 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 he had a connection to that. And then he just, I think, I don't know, I sort of sense that now being 44 myself, you're like, how much more in new input can I handle? <laughs> and yeah. so now I sort of understand how that is. That happened to me. The first time that happened to me was the first time I heard Skrillex in my late 20s. And it was the first time I thought to myself, well, that doesn't sound like music. And it was like, boom, right there. You just did it, Joe. Because uh -huh. that is music. Right. And you thought that it wasn't. Yeah. So you're old. It takes energy, too, to like keep going back to the well and keep trying to find new stuff. And mm -hmm. so just being aware of that, you know, you can make it through. You can make it through, find new things that you love. And, and be okay with not getting it. Like, that's another thing you're like, I'm trying to stay current, but I just don't get it. <laughs> Have you ever had the experience where um, something that you love now, like that's maybe like a foundational work that you like, you actively disliked at first? Because I've had that happen to me at first. The stuff that I end up liking the most, I don't like it when I first hear it. Um, that certainly happened to me with Dave Rawlings' guitar playing. He's now one of my favorite guitar players. But when I first heard it, it was so... I didn't understand that the dissonance was intentional. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it's they, they literally sounded like mistakes to me at uh -huh. first. And now right. I go back and listen to it and I can't go back and hear it the way that I first heard it because now I, I hear it how I hear it now. Yeah. And I think it helps too to see them play live too. Because when I first heard Gil and Dave, I thought that the vocals were the same person. I thought it was an overdub. A like double? A, yeah. I was thought it was all Gil or, or whatever, or all, all Dave. Um yeah, I know what you're talking about that dissonant thing. Sometimes we'll start a solo with bang, 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 bang. Yeah. That's just a, it's a half step. I read an interview with him or I heard an interview. I don't know what it was. And he was saying that they, you know, Time the Revelator starts with three dissonant. Dun, That's dun, what I'm talking dun, about. Dun, or yeah. four. And uh, they were playing it. I'm totally butchering this story here, but basically they were playing it for an engineer or a producer. And the person was like, well, you can't start your album out of tune like that. And Rollins, I guess, just couldn't understand. He was like, how do you not hear what I'm yeah. doing here? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I think uh, currently the way the music is transferred is having a lot of influence on how many times you hear it and how, how it's delivered. Like, I, I always make this example, like, I had a cassette of Greetings from Asbury Park, New Jersey, and the Springsteen record, and... I didn't like all the songs at first and that record's kind of squirrely and it's weird. Yeah. And, uh, but having on a cassette, you, you can't fast forward it. I mean, you're listening to your car, I'm driving around my Toyota Corolla and it's maybe it's stuck in there. Right. <laughs> you know, I can't get it out. Right. <laughs> and then I, you know, eventually I just like that record really sunk in and I love it for what it is. You know, I love the songs. They're incredible. So. Yeah, that, that's true. Uh, have you ever read that book? The medium is the message. I'm familiar with the idea, but now I'm really Yeah, about, it's yeah. Marshall McLuhan, and, yeah. and that's kind of what he's talking about, is that we always look right past what the medium is to what we perceive the content to be. But in fact, the medium is so much more um, uh, influential. That it, it, it matters that we know what it is. And like, yeah, you probably wouldn't have listened to the deep cuts on 
Greetings from Asbury Park if you grew up and you were just Spotifying it. Yeah. As great as I think Spotify is, I'm a huge evangelist for it, but it's changed the way you don't get into those for him, for for the boss, what are his C plus and D plus songs. Yeah. For the rest of us, they'd probably still be A's, but for him, you know, you probably wouldn't listen to those in this new medium. Yeah. Yeah. So I try, I try to do a, a miniature version of that where I like, I can't get internet when I, I have a little studio in my backyard now and it doesn't, I can't get internet and I got a new laptop and there's only a couple records in my iTunes. Right. So I'm like, this is great. I'm just going to keep listening to this record until it's like, I'm obsessed about it. What like do you I have, used to have. What do you have on there? Right now, the well, there's a couple of things that I've been working on, but I've got, um, this, the, the new Yola Tango record. It's really beautiful. It's called There's a Riot Going On. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like this line, the Family Stone title. Um, I just keep listening to that record over and over. It's it's Part of it's very ambient and part of it's rocking and part of it's very dreamy. Um, and there's also a record by this girl named Bedouin that I love. Yeah. Those two records I just been, when I'm wrapping cables or, you know, cleaning up, those are the two records that are just always on. on. Yeah. Right on. What was, so you kind of talked about your upbringing when you first kind of got out onto your own and started playing music in the world in your late teens and early twenties. Um, where did that look like? What kind of bands were you playing with and, and what were you up to? Well, I, I went to college in Bloomington, Indiana, and I went studied music there, studied classical guitar. Um, but the whole time I was playing in rock bands, I had, you know, all my buddies from high school, most of them moved down to Bloomington too. And so we continued our band, our band changed name to Old Pike from, you know, had a couple different incarnations. And, the, and in the late nineties in Bloomington, there was like a pretty hit happening music scene. Like every, everyone was going to see every other's bands. It was kind of like the only music scene I really felt deeply a part of where everyone was sharing and it was felt, it was competitive in a healthy way. And, um, and a couple of bands started getting signed, like my band got signed, and people were getting publishing deals and stuff, you know. Who else was coming out of that scene at the time? There is a band called Chamberlain. Uh, there are friends of mine from Indianapolis. Um, a band called Mysteries of Life got signed to RCA. A band called Sardina um, made a couple incredible records, but they were kind of a volatile band, and they didn't they didn't continue, which is really unfortunate because I loved them. And another band called United States Three. And they're just a ton. There are like a dozen great bands and everyone was playing together and, you know. I wonder what that is that makes a scene bubble up like that. Because that doesn't always happen. I mean, that sounds yeah. like a pretty... You're lucky if you get to be a part of that once in your life. Yeah, you exactly. Know? Exactly. And thankfully, one of my friends, Jeb, ha- ha- like made an archive of everyone's records. It's called musicalfamilytree.org. Uh-huh. So it's all of the B- Bloomington bands... Like all the stuff we released on cassette or whatever, he transferred it immediately, just collecting it all. So it's all exists. It's not all disappeared in like a box in your garage. So it's pretty cool. Um, so so Old Pike did its thing. We made a record. We did an EP, and then we made a rec- like a record for um, Epic. And uh, so you're signed by Epic. What was that process like? Did, I, it's amazing <laughs> to me that Epic was sending reps out to Bloomington, Indiana. They're based in like the Bay Area, right? No, they were in New York. It was, New York. it was Sony 550 Music Epic. And, you know, all this, you can't keep track of who, yeah. who owns who anymore. But uh, but we would drive out to New York and, and, like, play one show and come home. Really? Yeah, we'd go to play brownies or whatever and uh, try to get signed <laughs> or whatever and play South by Southwest. But we got a record deal, and, and, and it was cool because um, the things that led up to us getting signed were the magic times. And as soon as we got signed, nothing made sense anymore. <laughs> and uh, and my friend, uh, Mike Wanchik, who is like the longtime guitarist with Mellencamp and runs a studio in Bloomington, and he was really a mentor for us. And he was like, Carl, he's like, now all the work begins. He's like, it's going to get confusing. He's like, And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I have three grand in the bank. You know, I'm fine. <laughs> And, uh, Which might as well have been like three million. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm like go to the bar and play pool all night. Um, but and Mike, Mike was really uh, a wise guy, and we're still friends. And his, those words have haunted me for a long time because that, that was just the beginning. And I thought those were my dudes, my my dream, my band, and it did not work out. And everyone dispersed. And then, well, kind of, we'll break that apart for me. Like so, we, you have three grand in your bank account. You're going out to play pool at night. You're king of the world. It's, <laughs> it's time to make the record. Like we, we, on a granular level, like what started putting things astray? Is there like an A&R guy coming out from New York that's fucking things up? Is it you guys overthinking it? Like what, what happened? Yeah, 
it was a little more of us overthinking it. We made an EP and a lot of our good songs were on the EP. And then of course we're thinking, well, our record, we're going to do all new stuff. And we didn't, you know, we didn't have that perspective to zoom out and be like, you know what, make sure your best songs on the record. Don't, don't mess around. Um, yeah. But you know, it's like, it, it just, the, the luck was piling up and then it kind of dispersed. It's like we had great tours. We went and opened for Ben Fold five and had a great tour and, you know, we're getting, getting excited about it. And, uh, when you're a hundred percent reliable on your label, you're screwed. That's the lesson of that. It's like, you have to go out and tour if you get signed too early and you're not, you can't sustain your band without that kind of influx of money. Mm -hmm. You're setting yourself up to be disappointed. And I think that's what happened. And a lot, but they, and they were also signing a ton of bands, yep. you know, they signed a ton of bands. And they're like, well, old Pike, Good try. Next, you know. Yeah. And I thought our record was cool. Like I think it was our greetings from Asbury Park. Like we didn't quite nail it, but it was cool. Yeah. You know, we needed to make a couple more. Yeah. It, it, without the pressure of like it has to be successful, it has to be successful. In the second, we made some demos and stuff, but we're it just wasn't clicking anymore. And um, so uh, I'm glad it I'm glad it dispersed and it was over. Because so you could kind of literally feel like you tried to make another record after that first one, and you could feel that there just wasn't anything compelling about yeah. the music at that point. Yeah, and, and and we were trying to please someone else, and it wasn't like who we were. It wasn't like we got to make that record and have no consequences and keep recording and like touring and stuff and build. You have to build some sort of touring life to to sustain it in those in those dips because you can't you can't nail it every time in the studio. That's why it's so fun, yeah. you know. You just never know. It's in. Uh, it's like alchemy or something. You're like, man, maybe we're gonna get it this time. <laughs> yeah. And you always learn something. But, um, but yeah, at the time we were young and and kind of crazy and yeah. Know, well, I mean, with that studio stuff, it's like, I think you or me or anybody would be really happy if at the end of our life, and hopefully it's a long life, when we kick the bucket, I'd love it if just one of my songs was remembered. Right. It'd right. Be the greatest thing on the face of the planet. And. Uh, but then think about, you know, you've worked for 60 years and like, and one of those things might be remembered, you know what I mean? And it's just, <laughs> right. uh, it just shows you when you go in every day to either to write or into the studio, like chances are, it's probably not going to happen today, but it might happen today. Yeah. Today might be the day that you write, you're blowing in the wind or you write your, you know, you know, you record dark side of the moon. It might happen <laughs> today. Yeah. And you have to just keep going back to the well and keep trying. It's, I know you, I know you have a family and stuff, so it's like, Maybe we share the same thing where it's hard to be like, I'm going to go outside and I'm going to try to do something that may have no results, but I can't be with you guys right now. And that's really a hard thing to ju ju juggle right now for me, but it's getting a little easier. Um, well, but, yeah, but, but the upshot of that is like, you know, eventually uh, both of us do make money from creative work. It's just that there's not... There's just not a really straight line between the work and what people find valuable. And yeah. I find myself, you know, in the mornings I go, I built a little studio and I go and I have a babysitter come over for four hours while I work. And some days I'll just be down in the studio and the babysitter's with my kid. And I'm like, man, I'm just paying someone to be with my kid right now. Right. And I haven't gotten, there's been no good work that's happened today. I might as well have just hung out with my kid today. Mm -hmm. um, but... I thought that that could be the day that I'd write Amazing Grace, so I, right. I tried it. You know, <laughs> you have to, man. You gotta, you gotta set aside some time. Last year, leading up to working on this, my most recent solo thing, I took a trip to L.A. and just spent like two or three days in a VRBO looking over the ocean. Yeah, and I brought my guitar and I got started. You know, I got I wrote a bunch of songs that weren't worth a crap, mm -hmm. and then I ended up coming up with some stuff that I would have never done. Had I not been in that place, and it was really fun, was, and I felt I didn't feel guilty about it, yeah. you know. Um, even if I didn't have anything to show, it was just fun to be alone for a second, and yeah. to travel and be alone. Like, you know, being a touring musician, I'm sure you know, it's like you're tra you're like playing music is fun. You get paid to travel because yeah. that's a pain, and then you get home and like you're behind the eight ball, and your wife is like, "Here's the kids." Yep. As, as they well should. Peace out. Yeah. 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 And then, which is great. And you want, and you miss them and you want to be with them, but it's like, it's almost like you never get a break. And, yes. and it feels bad. To, I'm like not complaining because I love it. I love both sides of my life. And, yep. but, but you do need to like carve out a little time for yourself you <laughs> and do. not feel bad. <laughs> you do. Uh, you mentioned your son is nine. My son, he's about two and a half and he's just getting to the age. These last two trips I've done. 
he started to really understand, like when I say, hey, I'm going away, like he kind of gets that and he gets bummed out and it's heartbreaking to see. Uh (laughs) Um, What has your experience been like um, touring as a father? Yeah. uh, um, You know, my thing that I tried to do with Basil, especially when he was really young, is I would not be emotional about it Mm -hmm. in front of him. And he kind of... I was a little worried. I'm like, oh man, I'm making a sociopath because he was just like, later, dad, you know. But now it's getting a little more intense where he's like, oh, uh, you know, I'm going to miss you, dad. How long are you going to be? When are you coming back? You know, he has all those questions, but it's not really that tearful. Um, but but the cutest thing is I can tell how excited is he is when I get home Yeah, where, you know, he's just running his mouth and he's like, you know grabbing mother the hand we're going downstairs we're gonna go play games or whatever yeah. and you're, you're like he missed me <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he didn't say it but he, i can just tell on his energy and his body language and stuff so yeah. oh man it's gonna be such a bummer whenever he hits that teenage age where he doesn't care that you come back <laughs> all right <laughs> the door's locked and the music blaring yeah <laughs> Carl and his first band, Old Pike, signed to Epic Records in the late 90s. That major label system has roots that are over a century old. In the late 19th century, Alexander Graham Bell invented a sound capture device called a graphophone. The medium was an upright wax cylinder. The patent he sold to a man named Edward Easton, who founded a company called Columbia. Easton opened up branches across the U.S. with the intent that they would lease or rent the graphophones to individual users. But when sales were sluggish, he went into the field to find out why. Turns out, dealers were not leasing or renting the graphophones at all. They were keeping the machines, encasing them in ornate wooden boxes, affixing coin slots to them, and positioning them in strategic locations at drugstores, diners, casinos... The dealers had basically hacked them into jukeboxes. Easton realized he had to completely shift his company's paradigm. He couldn't be in the business of selling graphophones. He had to be in the business of creating and selling the content that people would play on the graphophones. So he hired local talents to play music, do comedy routines, whistle, perform derisive ethnic sketches. The technological catch, though, was that each wax cylinder had to be recorded individually. The concept of making a master recording that would then be duplicated hadn't matured. So, for example, brass bands were particularly popular because they were loud enough to play while 10 graphophones were recording them and then produced 10 wax cylinders. Then along came an inventor named Emil Berliner, who patented a technology called the gramophone. This would play a flat lateral disc instead of a vertical wax cylinder, much more reminiscent of the records that we think of today. The absolute crucial advantage of the Berliner gramophone was that many discs could be copied from a single master, no longer requiring performers to record each individual disc in a bespoke fashion. This allowed Berliner to sign headliner talent, the kind of world-class performers who would never subject themselves to the tedium of recording the same song thousands upon thousands of times over, such as Italy's famed opera singer Enrico Caruso. Berliner's company would eventually transform into the Victor Talking Machine Company, which would eventually become RCA Victor. Columbia and RCA Victor would hold a near duopoly on the recorded music market until they lost a patent suit brought against Jeanette Records out of Hammond, Indiana in the early 20s. This would open the floodgates to scores of other independent record labels. But that's another story. Let's get back to Carl. Old Pike signed to Epic Records. Epic Records is owned by Sony BMG. Sony BMG is constituted in large part by Columbia Records. That's the company that Edward Easton founded in the late 19th century after he bought the patent for the graphophone. And you remember who invented that? Alexander Graham Bell. So Bell sells to Columbia, Columbia sells to Sony, Carl signs to Epic, 
Finkel is Einhorn. Einhorn is Finkel. There you have it. I just drew a faint, meandering line between Carl and Alexander Graham Bell. <laughs> um, take me to the period between... So, when Old Pike kind of dissolves... Mm -hmm. Um, there's obviously a period between that and when you started playing with My Morning Jacket. Take me to that period. Was there ever a time when you thought to yourself, maybe this isn't working out. Maybe I'm going to go into electrical engineering. Maybe I'm going to, you, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, uh, what did that period look like? You know, you? I, I wanted to get into studio work, like recording studio work, because I took some classes at IU. So I knew how to work in a studio. I ended up never doing it. Um, I moved... Like the technical end of things? Yeah, like an okay. engineer producing mm -hmm. stuff, which I've been doing a little more nowadays. Um, uh, but I moved out to L.A. Uh, uh, the lady who's now my wife had had left Bloomington. She's like, all right, good luck with this. And it was kind of petering out. And so I finally f followed her out there. And, um, you know, I got work teching for a band for eight months. And really? I saved a bunch of money. And then On uh, the road? Yeah. Like wow. being on the crew of the band, and it was what band was it? It was a band called Lifehouse. Yeah, so it was like a you know the pop band, the rock band, because um, we had worked with their producer on the the end of the old Pike recording stuff, and I was like, I looked out, reached out to John. I was like, hey, you know, need an assistant in your studio. And he's like, I kind of don't, but you know, they're looking for crew. I'm like, I'll do it. Fuck, you know. So you were a guitar like, tech for? I was a guitar tech. What yeah. was that like? I, and were you on a bus and all that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So what? So that's like your first kind of taste of like. Uh, being a member of a high level tour, it sounds like you were opening yeah. for Ben Folds and all that. But yeah, yeah, we we were in a mini, we were in a like an RV in the old Pike tour at the big, at the best. Um, but yeah, it was cool to see the behind the scenes. I mean, I really appreciate having guitar tech right now. Yeah. Like <laughs> my friend Rocky is like one of my best friends, and like you know, I see people uh, abuse their crew and yell at them and get drunk and fire them and then rehire them and all that stuff. Like that's just insane. Like. You have someone who's stringing your guitar for you. Yeah. That's insane. Like, that's the most luxurious thing in the world. But anyway, so I did that for like eight months. And uh, and I knew the whole time, I'm like, I'm just saving money. I want to play play again. It's cool. I'll get my get my apartment settled. And uh, and then I started doing auditions in LA. I played with a bunch of bands. Okay. Just like tons of stuff. And um, so did you're, tours. So you're literally looking at like want ads for... for, for uh Guitar players or how, what's it? Yeah, there was like a circuit place? of, there was like a a person who kind of like put together bands. Like they're like, yeah. well, we, we, you know, band would get signed. Still people were getting signed to like right and left and they mm -hmm. go out and do a tour or whatever. So I'd just go do it for a couple months. And the good thing was like their records did their cycle, which not, nothing broke. And I was like, okay, I'm off to the next thing, you know? And uh, so but since doing that, and I was also writing a little bit um, in my apartment and then I got the call to go audition for my morning jacket. And um, the the craziest thing is that the week before I got called, I was driving in my car and I was playing with another band and I don't even want to talk about who it was. It was just a bad situation. And sure. I just felt sort of trapped and I was like, man, this is not my thing. Like I, I was really depressed. And uh, I was listening to KCRW and I heard the end of a song, which turned out to be a jacket song. And it was called I Will Sing You Songs. It was just the instrumental thing. I didn't even hear Jim's voice. Mm -hmm. And I remember driving across the Shakespeare Bridge in Los Feliz, listening to the song, and just kind of tearing up. I'm like, I would do anything to play something like that. Oh. Like, like that sounds like something that I would want to do forever. You know, and uh, and sure enough, I got the call, and I went out and bought all the records to get... And I'm like, oh my God, that's the song I heard on the radio. It's like, that was an amazing moment. And I'm like, I'm getting this job. Like, oh, so I'm, it wasn't like a nervous thing. Then it was like, fuck this. This is my job. Yeah, here. I'm holding up. I'm like, I'm going to learn whatever the guitar is doing on the right speaker and the left speaker. And when I get there, if he does this, I'm doing this. If he does this, I'm doing this one. You know, like, and I also had some mutual friends. I called my, called Bobby Bear Jr. who knew, who knew the jacket guys. And he was like, oh, yeah, I think you might be perfect, man. It's put, I'm like, put in a good word for me. Yeah. <laughs> so we did the we did I we auditioned and um. What do you show up at like a a sound stage or a studio? Yeah, it was like, just like a and and I learned later that the the guys in the band had never really played with anyone that they didn't know, and so they were kind of like not even sure they were going to hire anyone. 
And uh, okay, so yeah, yeah, <laughs> wow. So they were in new territory there. Too, yeah, huh? they were kind of like unsure. They're like, who? They saw the parade of LA guitar players, right, you know. Right. And I came in. I'm like, oh, I'm from Indiana. Like, I think I get this. <laughs> and uh, and then we went on, did some tours, and then started making records together. So it's kind well, of well. That's a quick fast forward. Then I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna pull you back there. Okay. So <laughs> you get the. How do you find out that you get the? Gig? Are you there in the room? They're like, this is it, man. Or do you get no. a call from the manager the next day? What does that look like? They had two days of auditions, and uh, so I had to sit through the second day, not hear anything. And, and finally, Jim called me, and I could tell he was smiling, but he he was like he was like. Well, man, I I don't know how to tell you this, but and I can tell he was smiling. Just, I'm, I'm like, just fucking tell me. Yeah. And I wasn't trying to be cocky, but I could tell he was smiling. Yeah. And he's like, you want to go on tour? I'm like, yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> oh, man. What a nice moment. And yeah. so is that like the next week you're heading out on tour or you rehearsed with him pretty for soon. We, we went to Louisville and rehearsed for a few days. Mm -hmm. And then our first show was in Bl Birmingham, Alabama. The Where band. was the band in its life cycle at that point? Had had it really broken through already? Was it a cult thing? Well, it was the third record. It's still Moose record. I mean, we were playing clubs, but they were full. Yeah. Oh, that's a and we fun... Were in, we were in a van, and yeah. we had a tour manager and a and one crew person. That's and we were driving and loading the gear. and like. But that I had never been point. in a situation where it felt like I was on the home team. And like we were, win we were like winning, winning, you know, like yep. we were ahead and like there was a groundswell and it was like, and the music was like, you know, out of this world. So one of the craziest things is we were, I had never seen the band. I'd listened to some of the music. My friend Cameron, uh, a friend of mine from Bloomington had played me at Dawn before, a lot years before. And uh, so I'd heard some of the music and um, we rehearsed and everyone's just sort of standing around, kind of going through them, just playing the notes or whatever. At the time, everyone had really long hair, and it was all kind of tied up in a ponytail. And Bo and I were the new guys to go. So Bo Coster joined at the same time. Oh, okay. And uh, we got down to Birmingham, and the show starts, and everyone on stage starts going insane. Like, you know, Patrick's just, like, hitting as hard as he can, and Jim's screaming and jumping around, and Tom's, you know, just getting evil on the bass guitar. And I looked at Bo, and we were like, oh, my God, what are we going to do now? And we just kind of jumped in. You know, it was like just trial by fire at that show. That was really, that was a special thing. I remember looking at Bo and we were like, wow, <laughs> what are they doing? <laughs> yeah, wow. And, and that energy just hits. Yeah. That's a really fun time. I did a tour once um, in like 2010. I opened, I supported like an eight-week tour for Justin Towns Earl, and he was kind of having a moment at that point. So it was all small clubs, but everything sold out in yeah. advance. And you could you could feel, it's just a different thing. And I've done tours where it's bigger rooms and, and all that, but there's just something about that point where you could tell people were just coming to it like it was a fire and they were warming yeah, their hands yeah. on it. You're like, oh, this is a special thing. Yeah. I the like snowball's this. rolling down the hill. You like let go. Yeah. yeah. It's like... Um, man. And so how long were those, uh, tours that you were going on in the van? Oh, it was, we, yeah, we'd go hard. Yeah. You know, I, I don't even know. I mean, it's just like, a, if you, if we look back at the, the archive on the website, it's just like 2005, it's just busy. 2006, we're just going and going, going to Europe and coming back. And yep. we went to Australia really soon after we joined the band. And that was a really fun tour. That was like our honeymoon yeah. tour. Yeah. Uh, was that was BT promoting? That oh yeah, one? yeah, yeah. Did some clubs and we did big day out and stuff. Uh, yeah. yeah, you know what it's like down there. You go down there and the what's the winner here? And it's just like you're sitting on the balcony drinking a Stella Artois with your friends. <sighs> so good. <laughs> I, uh, I've done many tours for BT, and uh, he's got this thing where we're good buddies. I'm sure you're good buddies with him too. And uh, we'll go to see bands and he's got this thing where, and he only says it when it's a really good band. He doesn't say it when it's a band he doesn't like. If it's a really good band and they're like, they're having like a moment and like everyone's like vibing on it. He like turned to me and with like, just kind of like a little smile. I go, it's good, but it's not the jacket, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh. so that's the the level of esteem that he oh, holds. For, that's amazing. That's, that's like a classic BT. <laughs> it's not the jacket, mate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I miss him. Um, he'll probably show up tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> he'll just somehow, pop out of magical warp zone and, and he'll be at the club. <laughs> somehow he'll he'll parachute in for sure. <laughs> um, now, 
with all this going on, you're you're with the band, you're you're down in Nashville. Tell me a little bit about, you know, how is your father following your career at this point? Is he is he interested in it? Is he worried for you, uh, given that he was a musician in a much more traditional and kind of right. conservative? Like, yeah. W- were you aware of his feelings <laughs> or his... Uh... Oh, definitely. I mean, I'm really close with my dad. And, uh, you know, he was worried about me uh, when I kind of was like, when the band had, when the old Pike had disbanded. and But I, I don't think he really thought that was going to go anywhere anyway. Um, cause like you said, he has no perspective. He's like, it could have been great. Um, but, uh, once I stopped asking him for money, he wasn't worried about me, <laughs> you know? And now, and once I started working, you know, I was just took that crew job and then I was, I was able to sustain, you know, being a higher gun for a, a bit as much as it was sort of like a drag, there are a lot of nice people. And, and I sympathize with bands who got signed and they're freaking out and they're trying. And I was just like, I'll try to help you as much as I can. And it was a good, crucible to go through and then you find something that you're like this is my shit right here this is my thing and i know what to do here and i've done all this other stuff so personality things i can like get into the pocket with this um but dad dad was you know he i'm sure your parents are the same way it's like they they attack they they get excited about things that are noteworthy like you played saturday night live like you can't deny you played saturday night live or you're on you know those sort of things the things that to me aren't as meaningful. Your parents, you kind of don't do it for your parents. They're like, you were in Rolling Stone magazine, son. You right. know, like, yeah, I was. Yeah, it was like I was one of the greatest, guitar, you know, number seven, the guitar gods or whatever. I'm like, yeah, yeah but Dave Rawlings wasn't in that list, so that list is bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but not for mom and dad. Man. But dad, yeah. he, you know, he digs it, and he he really he digs that the band is eclectic and crazy. Yes. He's like, it's like Jim sounds like Ema Sumac sometimes. Like he, he's like picking all these crazy. He's like, have you heard her? She's a Peruvian, no. like amazing psychedelic, you know, music. Um, incredible voice, you know. So he he finds his way into it, and he likes he likes the dynamics that we have, you know, because kind of orchestral, you know, it, totally. Sometimes doing that and playing the saxophone. He gave me a. He gave me the his baritone saxophone, and I took it to the studio, and I started playing it. You know, so yeah. it's like he he's in, he's always always uh, looming large in my life. This month's episode is also brought to you by Dead Oceans Records, and more specifically, the new album Eraserland by Strand of Oaks. Okay, if you listen to this show even semi-regularly, you'll know that I'm not the most objective observer when it comes to Strand of Oaks. Tim is a good, good friend of mine and has been for many years. That being said, I think the music on this record speaks for itself and I won't have to do anything to convince you that this is a special record by a special artist. And on this latest album here, he enlisted my morning jacket to back him up in the studio. I'm not saying that he hired a guy or two from the band. I'm not saying that they guested on a track or two. I'm saying that while their lead singer, Jim James, was working on a solo project, Tim enlisted the rest of the band to make the entire album with him. So, no big deal. Just one of the most iconic rock bands of the last 20 years going deep down the studio rabbit hole with him. No big deal at all. Uh, Let's take a listen. My mind was in the Blame it all on your faith If you want to live, then live with me And we, we can't choose To make love or lose If you're not done dreaming, then dream with me The new album is Eraserland by Strand of Oaks, out now on Dead Oceans Records. 
head on over to Spotify to give it a deeper listen. And if you dig it as much as I dig it, head on over to their website and pick up a copy on vinyl. Okay, back to the show. I'll take all that you give me while in Listening back to this interview with Carl, I was struck by how often the theme of fatherhood reoccurred. Carl said that his father's influence always loomed large for him. He and I also discussed reconciling the itinerant nature of our jobs with our kids. Those conversations reminded me of one of the most haunting poems about fatherhood I've ever read. It's by the West Virginian poet and wordsmith Steve Scafidi. It's entitled, Drinking Gift Whiskey. Between white miles of snowfall where the land drifts, gliding black water sears the local cold hump of place that is home to worn paths in briars. And my father and I, who count in the abacus of days another dusk as the sun disappears by degrees behind Short Hill Mountain. We are working through January's Arctic surprise to cross, on foot, the unfrozen waters of the brook, and step hand in hand as grown men in love from stone to stone, a bottle of mash, sloshing unopened as a gift for a neighbor in the wool pocket of the warm sweater he wears under his coat to hold in what is precious and unforgivably lost here. Taking one false step On a slick rock, he takes us both into the cold Virginia water he will die from in days. Alone, I am only writing now to say we almost made it to the Christmas farm, trees standing in snow like young scholars of the snow. We almost joined them, slowly plodding across the field. We almost made our way to the horse fence singing its barbed melodies in the holiday wind. We almost laughed our uncertain, though light way, into a neighbor's coat room, fully drunk with Journey's snowy work. Now I return every cold day to stand on the misshapen, force-worn stones, to feel the balance of who I am rock back and forth in the wood's wind, as bright, precarious birds make their familiar notes wing from oak to ash. And I swear to remember This is the place of my beginning. The one permanent moment where I learned loss is lugging your body back to the house, breathing the air of far pines on quick wind. Father, there are not many words I know by heart. As true as that late afternoon when you began to die in earnest. But I have learned for us in the cold work of rescue that fails some. Um, what have been, um, obviously you do that club tour with the jacket and you can kind of feel the ground swell. Was there a moment when it moved past that? Um, like, uh, I first became aware of you guys, I was living in Chicago and when Z came out, WXRT played off the record, like. I mean, they must have been playing it 15 times a day. It was crazy. I'd be driving to and from work, uh-huh. and I'd, I'd hear it on the way to work, on the way home <laughs> from work. So that had to be a time where it just exploded and went to an even further level yeah. than the tours before. What did that feel like? I think Z, that was that record was so much fun to make. Like that might have been the most fun one because it was sort of so unspoiled and like I had no expectations. You know, we we're just like riding the wave at that point went to this beautiful studio in upstate new york to a lair studios and work with john lecky who's a great producer we loved him just loved hanging with him and the songs felt great and uh you know when that record came out i think we were in a bus then and you know we played some kind of what turned out to be important shows like we played at bonnaroo some late night shows there and it started to you know 
like the sound of the crowd before we went on stage scared the hell out of me. Like it was so loud. Like, like people, you just know, the lights go down, yeah. that kind of thing. Like I never thought I was going to get to experience that. Oh, man. Like that's just so memorable. It was almost more memorable than the show. It's like the lights went down. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> they want us to play now. Yeah, so cool. Like I'll never take that for granted. That was so, so yeah. And then we just kept going. And then, you know, now it's 14 years later. You know, I'm not trying to rush you to the end, but like yeah. from Z to now, you know, we just we just been working and trying different things. We made a record in New York. We made a record in Louisville. And we made part of the waterfall in Louisville. We made most of it out in Marin County, which is awesome. It's yeah. been fun. We've tried to pick different locations to work. And, I'm a big have, believer in that, that geographically yeah. making... I've never made a record in the same town before. And I, I just... I love having the memories be attached to like a... I made one in Lexington. My last one was in uh-huh. Lexington, Kentucky. I'd never go spend three weeks in Lexington, yeah. Kentucky. But yeah. we did for that. And it That's was great. Cool. You know? Um, man, you were saying uh, just the sound of the crowd and how memorable that was. Uh my father was a musician basically till he had me when he was about 34, and they were a band around D.C., and it, once they had a gig at the arena there, and they were opening for Duran Duran when Duran Duran was at its height, uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, awesome. an opener hadn't been announced for the show, so when the lights came <laughs> down for them to come on, they got the Duran Duran cheer, right. uh, and it's funny, like looking back on it now, he's told me that story many times, just about that cheer right yeah. there. And he knew it wasn't for them. And it's still, still, it made a really big impression on it. Like he's never forgotten what that felt like. Yeah. You know? It, it, it just chills you. It's like, it's a, I think it's a human thing. It's like maybe being at the Coliseum or just something like... Mm-hmm. Uh, what well, we're I'm saying, I mean, not to get too metaphysical here, but yeah. there has to be some degree of like spiritual or mental concentration and energy from so many people concentrating on the same thing that just gives it such a profound sense of meaning, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a ceremony in a way, I think. I mean, I'm not big on going to church or anything like that, but like for me to have communal activities and live music, especially now, is just so absolutely important to just be together and you know even the thing we're doing this weekend is like the musicians were together like sharing like a new thing and then everyone who's there really wants to be there yeah you know it's just so special uh there i spent a lot of time touring where uh in previous bands where no one cared (laughs) and like so now even a small crowd that really cares is all that matters totally yeah yeah yeah, I've been, <laughs> I've been in, I've played in more shows where no one cared than than when they do. So yeah, <laughs> when they do when they do turn on, it it makes a di- big difference. And even when you're doing something, I've been at points with my own thing where I wasn't putting it together the way that I should. Like I didn't want to be there playing the songs that I was playing. I wasn't connecting to them. Yeah. And, and that's a really, I don't think that you can put your creative life together in a way where you never experience that. I just think you. I was having this thought the other day, and, and let me tell you, let me see if I can communicate it to you here. It, I've had times where things are outwardly going really well in a career and, and things are going well, and I know that I'm creatively bankrupt on the inside, and it's just a matter of time before things slow down. And then I've had, on the opposite side of the coin, times when things haven't been going that well on the outside and, and professionally, but I can feel the creative thing coming. And you just know for a fact, you're like, the thing that I have right now is gold in its own way. Yeah. And people are going to respond to it and things are going to change for me. It, can you feel that potentiality in your own creative life? Sometimes, yeah. And I have to do it. I get it from just learning. Like I just did this fall tour on my own and it was sort of the same thing. I was like, I think I know what I want to do next. And I wouldn't have known had I gone out and searched the world and played, you know, shows, good shows, bad shows, whatever. And, and I, for me, I think the hardest part is the repetition. And I think, I think you, you start to go insane when you're, I mean, I can't even imagine, you usually tour by yourself. Yeah. You're like on stage by yourself all night. Yep. So you're like face, it's like looking in the mirror all night. Yeah. And you're trying to like, play the songs that maybe you think they want to hear. And then those songs that you're feeling creatively inspired, you're like, how do you keep balancing that? Yeah. And just the repetition of it is crazy to be a singer. So I don't usually sing all night and you're used to it. And that yeah. was another thing when on the fall tour, I was like, man, singing all night is 
hard emotionally. Yeah. Um, I, I find that I have this thing, I had to start a, a meditation practice because I got into this thing where I had a moment of clarity before a show. Let's let's say this is about five years ago where I'm playing solo. And I was like, there's a couple hundred people out there waiting for me. They know all, you know, it's a, it's a small crowd, but they all know the words to the songs and they've, they've gone out of their way to come see the show and they've paid money and they really want to hear these songs. Uh-huh. And the songs are just in my brain right now. And I could forget all the words, right? And yeah. so I had a couple of shows where like I would just like freeze up and like forget these words and I had to to learn this meditation practice because I have to be on stage now and as that crops up, I have to recognize it for what it is and kind of set it yeah. aside uh-huh. and continue to go in. So before shows, it's like for me, especially, and it's only when I'm headlining, like tonight, you know, we're supporting Tim and I just got to play for a half hour and... I feel like for me, it's lower stakes. Like Tim's got to bring everybody home tonight. Yeah, It's not my job. Uh-huh. It's Tim's job. Exactly. So it's on him. Uh, but when it's my job to do it before a solo show, it's really fucking intense. And afterwards, I don't feel joy. I just feel like relief that I was able to deliver. Uh-huh. And I can enjoy myself for the rest of the night. And then when I wake up the next morning and know that I have a show to do that night, I'm really tense. Right. You're like, I have to go through this whole book of lyrics. Yeah. They're all in there, you know? They're in there. They're latent. Yeah. yeah. They're all in there. I was like, yeah, like I, that's the thing. That we, sometimes we'll play three nights in a row and not repeat any songs. <sighs> so, some, you know, we're playing 60 or 70 songs. I'm like, where are all the songs? Yeah. <laughs> well, they're not mine in a way. They're not ours. They're just sort of floating around there, you know? And you, if you have that kind of approach to it, you just catch it and, and toss it out there. I don't know. I mean... I do. I, I am kind of obsessive about preparation and rehearsal. Mm-hmm. I've been trying to like, you know, we're doing these shows, and I'm like, I know I'm going to memorize the lyrics to this song instead of just like having them on a piece of paper. Yeah, you know, and sort of challenge yourself that way. Um, yeah, I, I I probably practice too much, <laughs> 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 like stupid things that I just know I'll be fine. I'll know it, but I'm like, yeah, I need to re- I need to review that and make sure I know how many times that happens or whatever. Well, I think uh, you can find a happy medium between being completely unprepared on the one hand and <laughs> carving your own double reads from Kane on the other hand. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I, you know, exactly. And I, usually I wouldn't have any drink at, at all before a show. And then on my solo tour, I'm like, I'm having a glass of wine. It'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, totally. So I got to relax just a little bit. Man, I did the thing. I used to drink heavily before shows because I was nervous. And then... A couple of years ago, I was like, cool. Well, I'm going to continue to drink heavily because I'm an Irish bastard. But uh, uh, but I I stopped doing it before shows, and I was really – it was bad for like a couple weeks. And now I can't imagine times when I'm like, I used to drink six beers and get on stage? Like, what? Yeah. I couldn't do that now, man. Not even close. And the thing is, if you listen to the tapes, too, you thought the show was so emotionally releasing. And you listen – well, that was the thing for me. I really – I was like listening to the jacket – board recordings and I was like I thought that show was really good but it really wasn't mm-hmm. and and so now I know when we get off stage if it was a good show or not yeah um yeah so. I mean some people are, are good at the intoxication thing on stage but I think it's a rare thing I think in general it takes a lot it takes a lot of concentration to put on a good show like mm-hmm. a lot it takes all of my concentration to yeah, do and if it. something goes wrong can you recover from it and that's just it. Yeah. They say that um, apparently golf is a super mental game. And I've heard some sports psychologists talk about the reason Tiger Woods was so good at his peak is his ability to basically, basically not mentally punish himself after a mistake. It was yeah. mistake, move on. Uh-huh. You know? And uh, Yeah. That's your meditation practice right there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a pretty big believer in meditation in general. Not any specific vein or type because i don't think anyone can claim any sort of exclusivity that's been frustrating as i've explored it myself yeah but um but i think it it does not hurt you (laughs) that's what i'll say that's the only thing i won't like say about it because a lot of people are claiming all these great benefits and blah blah blah. you know unless you're mentally ill it will not hurt you (laughs) Uh, no i think even i mean i'm sure even if you were mentally ill because here what i didn't understand about it before I did it is I thought it was a spiritual practice. And I suppose that it can be if you mm-hmm. want it to be, but I didn't realize what a nuts and bolts, basically like mental train. It's like, it's like a jog for your mind. Yeah. It's a physical 
thing that you do with your mind almost. Um, uh, in, in the practice that I use, I just do like a guided thing. And mm -hmm. uh, the guy was talking about it afterwards. So you're concentrating on your breath, obviously. And he's like, don't get angry at yourself when your attention goes away and you redirect it. That's the whole point of it is learning to redirect the attention. Because yeah. then when you're on stage and you fuck up, I now have the muscle built where I can redirect my attention. Mm -hmm back to Carl playing his solo, and I yeah. know that I just fucked up the rhythm there, but I can get back to it. You know what I mean? And <laughs> right, right. punish myself. Yeah, that's good. And you teach your kids, too. It's like... Oh, I can't... Does you, do you do that with your son? Well, I've done it a couple of times. He, he really? tolerates it. It's really kind of fun. I'm like, I don't know what he's... I just think... Because he said, you know, I think kids now are more anxious than they used to be. He's a really kind of mentally advanced kid, and I think he has some anxiety, and like, I, I think it maybe will help him. I don't know. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, oh, man. Just a little quiet time away from a screen, and we tried to. T I tried to take hikes and stuff with him. Like, here's a camera. Let's go to the park. Yeah, and take pictures and stuff, just to go get out and like get that in, like exercise and meditation, all that stuff. It's so expen It's so important when you're on tour and you're old, older, and and being in nature. And being uh, in nature. I mean, have you heard of this thing in Japan now, where doctors will literally write you a note? To give to work, and it, it tells your work basically like this person needs to go to walk, walk in the woods today for two hours. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> That's just, awesome. Yeah, and just being yeah. around. I think just literally looking at when you walk into a forest, there's something. It's almost like a bath for your mind because you're you're just looking at the different. You're taking in all the different patterns, and you don't even know that you're doing it. And it yeah. just uh, it's like a nice white noise for the mind in a way. Yeah. Yeah, I treasure that stuff. I, when we were in when we were in Marin County working on the waterfall, I got a, a pass, so I'd go to Muir Woods whenever I wanted. And so if I'd wake up early and everybody was like, "Let's start at two o'clock," I'd be at Muir Woods at ten a.m. Yeah. taking a hike and just like and just soaking that in. That was great. I wish I lived in California sometimes, but oh yeah, <laughs> but I love I love where I'm at. Yeah, there's another study I heard of where what they're doing now with some kindergartners is I think this is in Germany. They take the kids into the woods, and then the responsible adults, they walk where they can't see, see the kids, but they're within earshot to see if something mm -hmm. here, if something terrible happens. But, And then the kids just free play in the woods with no direct supervision, uh -huh. and all their test scores went through the freaking roof afterwards, man. Right. Yeah. We're tapping into it. It's free. There's no medication yeah. involved. No. You know? That's great. Yeah. Uh, my, there's, there's, a, there's a naturalist thing at Basel School where they go off and... There's a point where they're they're like you go by yourself over there. And actually, I was playing tennis with with my wife the other day, and I'm like, Basil, come down. He grabbed a book and he just sat underneath a pine tree and read a book for like an hour. Oh man! And he was totally happy. And he was like, I'm rolling down the hill. <laughs> like, great. <laughs> God, that's a parent's dream right there. My God. Sometimes he'll be the ball boy, and but he's mainly just reading a book. And I'm like, all right, we're doing something right. I think. <laughs> Sounds like <laughs> so we keep like it, it up. Yeah. We we'll keep it up. Please. <laughs> Well, dude, thanks for taking the time to do it. has been this weekend's just been a blast. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's good to see you again. And yeah. uh yeah, I feel like third time's the charm. This is like our third interaction in the world. It is. We it's met like been kind of intense. Eight years and awesome. ago at the Bluebird in yeah. Nashville and now and then I saw you at Newport a couple of years ago. Like yeah. you did the like the Pickens party, the Jane Pickens thing with yes. like Eric and uh Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Eric from the Fruit Bats. Which I think, Eric, you listen to this show, I think. What's up, man? Hi, we got, buddy. We got to get you on this thing <laughs> sometime. Yeah, that was a really fun party. That yeah. was cool. All right. Thanks, I look Carl. look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, bud. Peace. Yep. That's our show for this month. Thank you for listening. Again, this month's show was brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Carl Brommel's latest album is Wished Out, available anywhere digital music is sold or streamed. You can find out more about Steve Scafidi's poetry at stevescafidi.net. Today's episode was engineered and mixed by Matt Schusler. If before we meet again, you sit down to write, please remember, an expensive drug habit is not a song, a compelling Instagram account is not a song, and most importantly, reverb is not a song. 
So let all that take care of itself. And for you, just keep your eye on the song. <laughs>